more. God bless you. Um, just turned on. I'm going to let a couple people get hooked up and get connected to us. Pastor Joseph Walker Jr. is watching. That means my wife has my phone and I have hers. That's what that means. If you're on, say hello to me. Amen. Here on the 24th day of March, the first day of our stay home given by our governor. Uh, here for our Tuesday night Bible study here. Going to live from... Uh, from my own living room here at the Walker House. Sister Alexis is on. God bless you. Elder Julian is on. God bless you. If y'all don't mind, tag a few people from RCF. Let them know. Bible study has started. I think we've gotten a couple people on now. Dr. Logan is on. Amen. Sister Lakeisha is on. Amen. Hey, Sister Alexis. Sister Kirk is on. God bless you. Amen. Good to see you all on this night. Praise God, Elder Julia. Amen. Whenever you see uh, a, a text from that says Pastor Joseph Walker Jr., that's actually co-pastor. Uh, she has a, a phone that has a much better picture than mine. So I'm using hers instead of mine. Sister Provitz on. Amen. Amen. Sister Janine is on. God bless you. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Amen. Sister Denson is on. Amen. Sister Cheryl Peterson. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Uh, amen. Go ahead and continue to tag some people. Amen. My mother-in-law is on. Bless you. Sister Tynetta. God bless you. Uh, continue to tag people. Let them know that our Bible study has started today and that we're on live. Uh, just a couple of announcements I wanted to start off with. Uh, number one, uh, if you want to see our Sunday service, for those who weren't able to make it out, or even if you were, you just want to review it again live. If you go to imrestored.biz, that's our webpage, and hit the media link, uh, it will take you to our YouTube uh, recording of our services. Uh, we now are recording all of our services on YouTube now. So if you go to that, uh, imrestored.biz. If somebody doesn't mind typing that in for me, that would be a blessing. imrestored.biz. Also, if anyone would like to help the basement ministries, the basement ministries are feeding people. They are taking care of people who, are, who don't have the food. Uh, they have a truck coming in Thursday. They'll be sorting food on Friday and do, doing some food distribution on Friday. If you would like to be a part of that, and if you uh, don't mind helping out, inbox me and uh, I can see what works for you and uh, we'll get you lined up. So we need about, she needs about four or five people for each one of those events. Amen. God bless you. Here we are. I hope everyone's doing okay. Um, what a strange season we're in. Uh, everyone's locked in, so I hope you have plenty of food. Uh, I pray that you are even in, in this difficult season, taking time to enjoy your family and enjoying these moments of quietness, of time of being still. Uh, as, a, as I think about all of this and what's been going on, uh, my thoughts today were what a difference a day makes. What a time that we live in. How many of you would have thought that by, how many of you thought on New Year's Day that Two and a half months later, three months later, that you could possibly believe, be locked in your in a stay at home notice by the governor, off work or working at home, uh, people being quarantined one from another, the mall completely shut down, stores closed, uh, businesses closed, and all of this would have been going on. Who would have ever thought that this would have been going on two and a half months later? Uh, but let you know that things do change and things change very quickly. Uh, in, in this time, it's interesting. Even today, I heard our governor 
I wanted to quote a prayer. I hear people talking about prayer more, and I'm in 100% agreement. This is the time that definitely more prayer is needed and more prayer is necessary because the truth be known, God is the only one that's going to make a difference. When I think about this year and I look at this year, our theme this year is from Deuteronomy 1 and 21. If you haven't looked at it, you ought to look at it tonight. Deuteronomy 1 and 21 says, Behold, the Lord thy God has set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of thy fathers has said unto thee. Fear not, neither be discouraged. Before I go any further, if you have questions, if you want to say anything, co-pastor is right here in the room with me. If you type your questions, she'll answer, she'll ask them for me because I'm not reading all the questions right now. But if you type the questions, she'll ask the questions so that she'll read them out loud so that I hear them so that we can uh, correspond. So if you have things you want to say, questions you want to ask, please don't hesitate to type your questions or type comments that you want to make. Uh, if you want to insert some comments, she'll also uh, say your comments out loud. Uh, that's our theme, though, Deuteronomy 1 and 21. Uh, Behold, the Lord thy God has set the land before thee. Go up and possess it as the Lord thy God of thy fathers has said unto thee. Fear not, neither be discouraged. From that, restoration drew from a thing, possessing the land, faith over fear. When you look at this text, Israel here in Deuteronomy, these last few days before they went into the promised land, is Moses is really his farewell speech. He's given his farewell speech and reminding Israel of what God said. Because by the time they get to this point, there were many who weren't going to go into the promised land. So you almost have a new generation that stepped up. So in Deuteronomy, Moses is reminding them of all the things that God has said he would do. He's encouraging them how God brought them uh, out of Egypt, how he delivered them through the Red Sea. He's encouraging them and letting them know what God's going to do. But in order to get this land, Israel learned that there were some things they were going to have to do. That is, they were going to have to battle. Uh, they learned that it was given to them, but in order to take it, there was going to be opposition for them to get this land. Uh, some of this shouldn't be uh, strange to you. I've been talking about this. Uh, I preached four sermons in a row. Uh, one was Jericho. When they went to battle Jericho, listen, Israel learned in Jericho that even though the walls were big, even though the enemy was locked in and we did not have the natural strength to, to knock it down, these walls were, there were two sets of walls that Jericho was fenced in around. And so when Israel walked around the walls of Jericho, the outer wall was about 30 feet high, six feet wide. The inner wall was about 30 feet high, 12 feet wide. And Israel walked around these walls and these walls came tumbling down. What they learned there, that it did not matter how big, how impenetrable, uh, if that's a word, I just made it up, if it ain't. It's a word, it's a word co Pastor said. <laughs> if they learned that God was able to break through anything, that's a word right there, that no matter what's going on, God is able to break through anything. Then they get to IE. They get to IE. They thought this was going to be an easy battle, but they lost the first round because of disobedience. So then they found out this. Listen, we messed up, but if we repent, God will turn it around for us right there. They didn't have to wait. Soon as they repented, they were back in the right place, back in the right, right fellowship, and God turned it around. So first they learned it didn't matter how strong the fortress, God could take it down. Second, they learned the power of repentance. Number one, you obey God. But when you mess up, how many know if you repent, how many know God will forgive you? Has anybody ever been forgiven when, when you repented unto God? Is anybody thankful that God forgives? If you are, here's some lights right there. Amen, 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 amen. Next, they went and then the kings, the, the battles from the south. Oh, here what happened here. The kingdoms from the south heard about what happened when they went up against Jericho and when they went up against Ai. And so they said, let us come together and attack them at once. And so then you saw that when the enemy conspired and they came up against them, they lost the battle of when they conspired and came up against Israel. So now that's the third lesson they see, that even when the enemy comes together because they feared, they still lost the battle. Then the fourth battle that we hit, uh, we just hit right before all this lockdown and all these things happened was when 
all the tribes from the south. Now, it's interesting. When they went up against the tribes from the south, they went up against them. Everybody that was left, it said that this, it said there were so many, it was more than they could number. They went up against everybody that was left. They were vastly outnumbered. They, they had every army that they could pull. I counted in the Bible named at least 15 kings that came together. And really it was more than 15 because I was counting one when it says all those on the east, all those from the west. And we don't know how many that was, but at least 15 kings, more than that, came together up against Israel. Listen, they came together to take down Israel and they had more people than Israel. They had more manpower and warriors than Israel. And listen to this. They had more technology. They had horses and chariots and Israel didn't. But what Israel found out is this, that even when you're outnumbered, even when you don't have the technology, even when you don't have the resources and strength on your own, as long as God is fighting the battle for you, you're going to get the victory. You have to know this. As long as God is fighting the battle for us, we have the victory. If you believe me, you ought to say amen and hit some likes right there. If you know you got the victory, you ought to say it right there. Amen. 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 Here, I done got excited and lost my page of notes, but I'm going to find them again. Amen. Here we go. Where they at? Okay. So when you look at this here, um, so Israel learned that uh, some strategies when they fought these battles of Jericho. Uh, and why am I bringing this up? Because church, we have to realize that it's now time for us to fight some battles. It's now time for the church to be strong. With all that's going on, this is not the season for the church to be weak or for the church to feel like, what do we do? This is opportunity for God to be glorified. This is an opportunity for the power of God to show up strong. Had, had the disciples not been in a storm, Jesus couldn't have spoke to the, to the winds and the waves and said, peace be still. Had Daniel not been in the lion's den, he could not have shut the lion's mouth. Had the Hebrew boys not been in a furnace, he could not have took the heat out of a furnace. Had, had, uh, had Israel not been backed up against the Red Sea, he couldn't have opened it up to give them to take them through on dry land. Listen, had we not been in this coronavirus, what are we going to be able to say about God? What are we going to be able to say happened in the household of faith? What are we going to be able to say God did in this season that only God can do? I don't know about you. I know this looks like a crazy time. I know this looks like a wild time, but I believe it's a God season. It's a moment for the, for the God we serve to stand up in us. He's ready to move. We just got to be ready to say yes to him. Is there anybody that's ready to say yes to God? Amen. 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 Second Timothy 1 and 7 says, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of a sound mind. You need to put your hand on yourself and say, I will not fear. Listen, I don't care what's going on. We are not supposed to be fearful. We don't have to fear. Uh, you ever watch a little child? If they feel like they've lost their parent, they get scared. They start crying. They don't know what to do. But soon as their parent come around, even though it looks like a bad situation, there's a peace that comes around the child as long as they can hold on to their parent. Church, we got to hold on to God. There's a peace that we can have as the body of Christ, even in this time, in this season, if we hold on to God. I don't care how it looks. God is able to give a peace in the midst of the storm. We don't have to fear when we know God is up to something. One of the questions that I asked that often is asked. I can't even say I asked it, but one of the questions that is often asked to me and often that I hear is, and I know you've heard this, why do bad things happen if God is so good? Have anybody ever heard that? Why do things happen bad if God is good? Why do babies die when they're innocent if God is good? Why do people get killed and murdered that if God is so good? Why do bad things happen? If God is good. And that's a question happening. So why is this 
coronavirus happening if God is so good? Of the reason that this is happening is a very simple answer. We all know it's all because of sin. Uh, if you could turn and look with me in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, it says, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest of it, thou shalt surely die. Adam and Eve were set in the garden. They were set in a place that they were free to serve God. Uh, they, were, they had been called to take care of the garden. They had been called uh, to a place where they had an intimate relationship with God. Adam would get up in the morning and walk and talk with God. Uh, his relationship was unimpaired in any way. There was no space, no division between them. There was a complete connection the way God wanted. But sin came in. What sin did, sin divided. It put death in. Sin introduced death. And it caused a separation that to take place between God and man. Because the thing we have to remember about God is this. God is a holy God. Bottom line, he's a holy God. And a holy God cannot take sin in his presence. That's why it takes us being covered in the blood of Jesus. Without the blood of Jesus, we could not boldly come into the presence of God. We would be consumed instantly. If you remember in our study we did, or anybody ever did a study on the holy place, when, the, when Moses uh, got the instructions for building the, the tabernacle and they built the, the tent of meeting, whatever we want to call it, there's several names for it, and they would go in there to worship, they had to be holy to go in there. They had to go in there with their sins forgiven because if you went into that place and you weren't right, you could die. Remember the story when David, they were moving the... Uh, they were moving the the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, and they one of the men reached out and touched it and died instantly. That's because we can't even touch the things of God without holiness. And because we've all made mistakes, that's why we have the blood of Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus that gives us access. That's why he says in Hebrews 4, he says, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we can obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The only reason we can come boldly to the throne of grace of God is because of the blood of Jesus. If it wasn't for the blood of Jesus cleansing us and washing us, there's no way we can come boldly into the throne room of God and touch his presence. But I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that we don't, we don't have to wait to get to God. Now, how many of you are glad that you can boldly come to the throne of God and touch his presence? If you're glad about it, you ought to say amen right there. So, sin entered the world. God then put a plan in place. Uh, when you read Judges, uh, Judges is a book. I, I hope I didn't jump too quick, but I wanted to get to this. Judges is a book that really takes place after, it's after Joshua. Uh, it's one of the foundational books. It's after they've conquered the, the main territory and they've divided the land. Uh, once they divided the land, each tribe has its own land. And now, because at this point, there are no kings. Because God never wanted a king over Israel. God always wanted to be their king. He wanted to be their leader. But they end up getting a king later, which is a, another whole, I don't want to chase that rabbit. But they wanted to be like the other tribes. But they didn't have kings. What they had was judges. And that's what the book of Judges deals with. It deals with the story of about 12 of these judges who judged different tribes of the children of Israel uh, once they got into the land of Canaan, their promised land. Uh, if you look, there's two scriptures that are identical. One is Judges 17 and 6. The other is Judges 21 and 25. You can look at either one of them. They say the exact same thing word for word. No deviation. Judges 17 and 6 and Judges 21 and 25. They say this. In those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes powerful. Israel started getting in trouble, started going into bondage, started experiencing some difficult days 
because they got to the place that God had blessed them to get. And they start doing what they thought was right in their own eyes. Listen to me, saints. Listen to me. It is dangerous for you to do what you think is right. It's dangerous for me to do what I think is right in my own eyes. Because if we could be 100% real, how many of us know that we can justify our own actions sometimes? I told you off because you deserved it. I went off on somebody because they deserved it. I took that stuff because it should have been mine in the first place. I needed it. How many have done some things because they felt like it was justified? We can't allow what we think is right to dictate how we live. We must ask the question, what does God feel about what we do, what we say, how we live? One thing we can do during this time, listen, we got extra time off work. We got time at home with our families. Uh, you got time that you didn't have before to do things that you couldn't have done before. And we have to ask this question to ourselves. We have to do a self-evaluation and we have to look at ourselves, not from our own eyes, but look at ourselves from God's eyes and God's perspective. What does God think about my life? That's the question you got to ask yourself right now. What does God think about what I'm doing every day? Okay, I know right now you can't go nowhere, but I'm talking about when all this is over and you're trying to go back to work, when all this is over and you're going back to hanging and kicking it with your friends, when all this is over and you're going back to the same old meetings, the same old hangouts, the same old routine, what does God think about my life? And is what I'm doing giving glory to God and is it pleasing to God? Because God wants how I live to be pleasing to him. I believe that we have get, gotten our schedules so busy that we filled them up with everything we could except for what God wanted us to do. And we've allowed ourselves to get consumed with life without honoring and respecting God. We have allowed ourselves to get occupied with being busy with things that have nothing to do with God in all thy ways. The Bible says, acknowledge him and he shall direct our paths. How many know? Listen, I believe God is putting us all on a steel. Listen, God put us on a fast. Usually when we think of a fast, we think of no food and we spend the time with God. God put some of us on a work fast. God put some of us on a meeting fast. God put some of us on a run in the street fast. He put some of us on a hangout fast. He put some of us on a fast food fast. God has changed our lives and said, listen, I need you to stop what you're doing. I need you to check out yourself because I am coming back. And I need you to look and say, am I pleased with what you're doing? Am I pleased with your life? Is God happy with how we're living? Is he happy with the decisions we're making? Is he happy with how, how we're caring about in this world right now? And that's so critical because we can miss the whole moment and go back to our schedule and go back to the same place when God is trying to take us to someplace greater. God wants to do something big. I really believe just like when 9-11 hit, you remember when 9-11 hit, uh, it changed the world. It changed how you move around from country to country. It changed going to the airport, flying from place to place. It, it changed procedures you had to go through, uh, your identification you needed. There were some adjustments that took place because of 9-11 that it never went back to being how it was prior to 9-11 because of what we've been exposed to. We've been exposed to something with this coronavirus that has changed our way of living. Because guess what? We'll, we're going to be quarantined for a few days. We're going to be uh, on these stay-ins for a few days. But do you really think coronavirus is leaving in a few days? Do you really think it's going to be completely out of here in a month? It's here to stay. It's part of our new normal. It's the flu. You, you Even they, what was it they got rid of? Uh, the, the chicken pox they thought they did. And it's back. It's here to stay. And we're going to have to learn how to deal with it. Which means they're probably going to make some adjustments to how we live how we operate and how we do life, which means as the church, 
We got to say, what is God calling us to do different in ministry? Because we have to realize this is an opportunity for the church of the most high God, not to be on the tail end struggling, but be on the front end saying, Lord, what is it you want to do? Lord, what is it you want to say? God, how is it that you want to move? God, what is it you want to do? Because ministry has changed. It's forever changed. Things are different now. Pastors who weren't even thinking about uh, electronic giving are thinking about electronic giving. Everybody on Facebook, I bet there's probably 50 other pastors right now on a Tuesday night service on Facebook. Tomorrow night be booked because everybody got Wednesday night. Going to be thousands on Wednesday night because we've learned to do ministry in a different way. Because one thing, you can't keep the word of God bottled up. It's going to get out. But we have to decide as the church, how are we going to operate in this season with these great transitions? What is it that God wants to do that he can do through us so that we can be effective and not just so that we can do status quo, but how is God going to do the supernatural through us? What about my ministry is going to give God room to move supernaturally? What about my ministry is going to give God room to do the impossible? We got to quit thinking in the box. We got to quit thinking to contain ministry. But I serve a God that does supernatural things, that move in supernatural ways, that does miracles, signs, wonders, healing, deliverance. God does miracles that we cannot imagine. So what about this season is going to allow God to do miracles through us? Could this be an opportunity for the church to stand up strong in this difficult season. How many are ready to stand up strong? I'm ready to stand up strong. I'm already thinking. We all should be thinking. What is it that God wants to do? How is it that God wants to move? How is it that God wants to speak? Because God wants to do something. Amen? Amen. Amen. Second Chronicles. And I know I dealt with this last time, but I, I need to deal with this again because it's just relevant. Uh, Second Chronicles. Uh, seven, and it says, uh, and the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Listen to this. This is a powerful scripture. Uh, when you look at this whole scripture, uh, God was dealing with uh, Israel. Uh, Solomon was just getting a vision by night. He had just had a high moment with God. And how many know that it's oftentimes after a high moment that something uh, challenging, something catastrophic can come and cause you to have to deal with it. Uh, God, God had just given him a high moment. And in this high moment, uh, coming out of this high moment, Solomon experienced some challenges because God wanted to let him know that some things that could happen uh, after the glory filling the temple so far that they couldn't uh, minister. Verse 12 comes down just verses before. And he says, I've heard thy prayer. I've chosen this place to myself. For a house of sacrifice. Uh, this is powerful. And, and this is this is a, a powerful word right here. I know we always look at 14. If my people. But if you would look at that. Back up to verse 12. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night. And said unto him. I have heard thy prayer. And I've chosen this place to myself. For a house of sacrifice. Why am I emphasizing this thing right here? Uh, because Solomon built the temple. Remember David wasn't allowed to build the temple. He wasn't allowed to build a temple because uh, he had done some things, uh, the murder, the uh, adultery, all of the things he had done having to do with Bathsheba, that in all the murders he had done, God told him uh, that his hands could not touch the temple, uh, but his son would be the one to build the temple. So here comes Solomon, his son. Uh, Solomon, his son, is building the temple and when they do this, the glory of the Lord fills the place so powerful that uh, they, he can't even stand to minister. But God warns him in verse 12 and says unto him, first he says, I've heard thy prayer. Solomon prayer and he says, I've chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. 
uh, critical here. All the work that had been done to build the temple, all the work that had been done for a place to worship, all the work that had been done for a place that you call your church home. But the key was not everything that Solomon did. The key was what God did. Solomon built it, but it didn't become hallowed until God chose it. <laughs> Woo! So listen, you can build something, but it does not become hallowed. It does not become holy unless God chooses it. If God would not have chosen it, it would not have been a holy place. It just would have been a place. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I got excited myself. Uh, see, the problem is we've, we've gotten too many places that we, we build them. And we, we think because we build it, God's got to show up. <laughs> we think because we built it how we want to build it. We've done what we want to do. We think God's going to be there. And we know the actions to carry out to make it look good, but it don't mean that God's going to be there. But listen, they built it, but it wasn't until God says, listen, I have chosen this place as my place of sacrifice. I'm almost done, but there's a couple things. Number one, number one, we have to realize that God has to decide to choose our house. So what makes the house an acceptable place for God to choose because you can't wait till Corona hits and have a messed up temple and think all of a sudden because you did something, God going to feel it. If your temple wasn't right in the first place, you got to get the temple right before you can ask for the presence to come. Too many people want the presence without getting the temple right. It starts with this, our bodies, but even the house of God. If the house of God has not been prepared for the king to enter, what makes us think the king is going to come in if the house has not been prepared? You cannot give God a crappy old building. You cannot give God a defiled house. You cannot give God. Listen, you don't have God time for God all week long, all the other times. And now when a crisis hit, everybody want to crowd to God and wonder why he ain't moving quick enough. Did you ever think he'd been trying to get our attention the whole time? Jesus. He's been trying to get our attention the whole time. And now he's put us all on steel. Stop. Stay home. I, listen, scared to move. They talking about what they're going to do for Corona. And people are like, oh, we just got to pray. You right. But that what's any believer in the house. No, that ain't new news. When do we not have to just pray? Right. All right. There's another point in here about the house. Lord, prayer in the Psalm of the night, I said, I've heard thy prayer and I've chosen this place for a house of sacrifice. Solomon had made this place a place of prayer. Everybody wants to come to the church. Find the people of God because they want to pray. And if you know prayer is all right, you ought to say amen because prayer is good. But we want to give God a half service because he said, I've chosen this. Listen to what God says. I need to read it one more time. Some of you already caught it. Y'all already ahead of me. He says in verse 12, I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. How come Folk want to pray, but don't want to sacrifice. He says, this is a place of sacrifice. When you think of God's house, you just can't come in without giving something. And we want to come in and say, God, I need, God, I need, God, I need, God, I need. But God is saying, but what are you willing to give unto me? God, I need this. We need help. We need healing. We need deliverance. Our, our state is in trouble. Our come, but what are you willing to sacrifice? We have to remember that God's house is not only a place of prayer, but it's a place of sacrifice. Listen, it's, 
I know when you hear us in worship, we got to give a sacrifice of praise, but it's much deeper than just sacrificing of praise. It's much deeper than just a sacrifice when you're in the house of God. If the only time you got a sacrifice is from 11 to 1 on Sunday, you got a weak sacrifice. But how many know your sacrifice has to be a sacrifice that you're willing to commit to and do, not just on a two-hour span out of your 168 hours of the week, but what are you willing to give up for God so you can get glory? I remember this. I remember people used to tell me this all the time. And I hope I hope I step on somebody's toes. I remember people used to tell me this. They said, listen, uh, I want, this is before I was pastor. I remember this all the time. I ain't going to be at church because uh, I got to work. I, I can't come because I got to work. And I'm like, man, yeah, you got to have your job. You got to work. You got to go. And then I got a job where a lot of these people were working. And I found out that overtime was optional. And I thought all these people had to work. But what it was is they chose the dollar over the king of kings. They'd rather have a dollar. They'd rather get some money than spend time in the house of God and worship. This wasn't straight time. This was overtime that they had options for. And instead of saying, listen, I believe that God will rebuke the devourer. I believe he will open up the windows and pour out blessings. I believe he will cause men to give unto me. They said, instead of getting to the house of God, I got to get to the house and make more money because I need to get that, but more than I need to give God. But how many know God is saying, what are we willing to sacrifice so that we can get to him? What are we willing to sacrifice so that we can have his presence? We cannot allow this world, the systems of this world, the things of this world to get in the way and interfere with our relationship with God. What God wants is a relationship with you and I. God does not want to be consumed, our time to be consumed by the things of this world. He said, I put you on a stop because now it's a time for us to get, listen, churches, wherever your church is, whatever your house you in, you gotta, you need to now look and say, God, what is my goal? What is my assignment in my house that I've been called to worship in? And if you ain't got a church home, you need to repent for that and ask God to lead you to a church home. And don't talk about ain't no good ones because ain't none of us all together, right? But we serve a God that's perfect. So you need to find one. You need to get into a church home. And then you need to say, God, what is it that you've called me to do? What is my assignment? What is my work plan? What is it that you want me to do in the house of God? Because God has a plan for us. And in these days, when times have gotten difficult, it's time for the church of the most high God to stand up and be strong. It's time for the people who say they go to church now to quit going to church and become the church. It's time for the people who got their name on the roll to say, quit saying, now my name is not just on the roll, but my body is going to be in a seat on Sunday. My hands are ready to go to the plow and do work. I'm ready to usher. I'm ready to sing. I'm ready to visit the sick. I'm ready to go feed the, the hungry. I'm ready, to, I'm ready to go lay hands on people that are sick. I'm ready to go to hospital and visit. I'm ready to go to nursing homes and visit. I'm ready to go do some street ministry. What are you ready to do for God? Because time is running out and God is saying, are you ready to serve me? It's time out for excuses. It's time out for making up reasons why we can't get out to worship, why we can't serve God. God has put us on a moment here where we can have a selah. You're in a selah moment where you have a moment to think, God, what is it that you're saying about me? Don't complain about your neighbor. Don't complain about your spouse, your children. Don't complain about churches. Don't complain about the present community because what you need to ask, I've got to ask this. We have to ask God, what are you saying to me? What is my assignment? Because if I follow my assignment, I'm going to be empowered to carry it out. So if I know my assignment, I don't have to know how I'm going to do it. I just know that God's going to give me the power that I need to do it. What's your assignment? In this difficult day, what's your assignment? In this tragic hour, what's your assignment? This is not the time to be weak. This is not the time to be frail. This is not. This is the time that you should want God more than ever. And don't let it be a seasonal want. Make it be a transition in how your mind thinks and how you operate. God, this is my new me. I'm resetting my life. I'm getting rid of some stuff. I'm moving some stuff out the way that shouldn't have been there. Listen, time that you had occupied, that you knew that you had taken from God, you need to get, you need to get rid of those things. Get rid of things that got in the way of your relationship with God. 
You know why people don't go to church now? Because our parents, mine did, some of the parents didn't teach the children about going to church when they were young. So they think when times get hard, they don't need God. But we have to teach our children that Jesus Christ is the only way. We have to teach them to serve God. Amen. God wants us to not just have a house of prayer, but a house of sacrifice. He told Solomon in that, in, the, in that, uh, what was that? He told Solomon, second, second Chronicles 7, he told him, my house shall be, I've chosen this as a house of sacrifice. What are you willing to sacrifice so God can get glory out of your life? That's the question you have to ask yourself. What am I willing to do different? Am I going to let this stuff happen and go back to being the same old person? Am I going to let this stuff happen and go back to acting the same old way? Or am I going to allow God to make some transitions in my life? I believe that the power of the church should get stronger in times like these and continue even after this more than diminish after this. Because things happen. People want to get to church for a moment. But when it's over, they want to go back to where they were. But listen, this is the time for us, the church of Jesus Christ, to be the difference maker in this time. Amen. If you believe that, somebody hit some lights and some hearts and say amen right there. It's our time. It's our time to make a difference. It's our time to stand strong. It's our time to let them know that the God we serve is more than able. Uh, don't, don't, don't allow this season to go by and not realize God is moving. Don't allow it to go by and, and just chalk it up as this bad coronavirus. I was thinking when they were talking about uh, this virus and how they're trying to stop it and how they're trying to control the spread. I said, I wonder when the plague of boils started hitting that they think they could stop the, the spreading of that in Egypt. I wonder when the lice came that they think if they closed the doors, the frogs wouldn't get in. But you see that stuff got in no matter what doors were closed. When sin gets on the rise, you can't stop the effect it has. Only God can get rid of these things. That's why we got to go to Christ. Amen. 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 God bless you. I pray that you were blessed by, by this lesson. Uh, restoration. Listen, uh, be encouraged. As of now, uh, we haven't changed our plans for Sunday, but we definitely will be revisiting. Uh, we usually have a meeting with our executive staff on Friday evening, and we make a decision that evening. And by Saturday morning, I'll be announcing for sure our plans on Sunday of what we plan to do. Uh, but please stay tuned one way or the other. Whether I'm in my living room or whether I'm at the church, I will be on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. So please tune in this Sunday at 11 o'clock for our service. If you miss service, uh, go to IamRestored.biz. IamRestored.biz. And you can go to that. takes you to our webpage. You hit tune in. Go to media. And you can see our broadcast that we did this past Sunday. We had a powerful service. Let me tell you. Service was off the chain, and when we gave the benediction, the church went into a praise party that just was off the hook. It wasn't a lot of us, but it didn't take a lot of us. Uh, we just went in. That's all I can tell you. We had a time, and if you want to see the clips, uh, we had about everybody had their uh, phone out doing their own phone recordings. So just go to somebody's on the praise team, uh, co-pastor, minister Belinda. Elder Julia, I think, put it on our uh, restoration page. Uh, my phone did a horrible job, uh, but we had a, a, a great time, and it was recorded. I think uh, Sister Nikita recorded it. I saw her phone out. Uh, Minister Shaniqua, she recorded it. Uh, check it out, because I pray that it encourages you in this difficult time. Listen, uh, we still need, the church still needs offerings. <laughs> we still have to pay bills. We still got to pay the light bills. We still have to cover uh, our insurances. We still have to do those things. So please don't forget your offerings into the ministry. And those of you who have another church home, your pastor needs your offering too. So send your offerings to your home church. Um, I ain't trying to steal nobody's offering. Everybody's church needs them. Listen, if you have electronic giving, restoration, we have Givelify and we have Cash App. You can use any of those messages. If you, if you download the app Givelify or use Cash App, Dollar sign RCF 760. You can give with Cash App. Dollar sign RCF 760. And with Givelify, just download the app, 
Look up Restoration Christian Fellowship Church. And you can give that way. If your church has that, give that way. If your church doesn't, mail the, your church a check. It will get there. Better late than never because they still got to pay bills. Uh, your pastor still needs to be taken care of and be blessed. Uh, mail it to your home church. Uh, and if you're out, you got to go to the store, go drop it in your church's mailbox. Don't forget your offerings. Restoration, if you want to mail yours in, ours is 760 Main Avenue, Southwest, uh, Warren, Ohio, 44483. That's 760 Main Avenue, 44483. You can mail it in. You can drop it in the mailbox. You can use Givelify or you can use Cash App. Any of those methods are appreciated. But please don't forget to give your offering because we still need it. We're still trying to run the ministry. We're still trying to bless and take care of people uh, in the restoration family. We want to make sure nobody goes without at this time. Uh, another announcement, don't forget the Basement Ministries. They are uh, feeding people. And uh, Pastor Julia has reached out. And uh, she needs some help unloading the truck on Thursday and bagging and distributing food on Friday. So uh, if you have, uh, you'd like to get out the house and come help, uh, I think Friday, Thursday, she only needs you for a couple hours between 10 and 12. And Friday, uh, it's 4 o'clock, uh, going to be sorting the food. And at 6 o'clock, she'll start distributing. You can either help at 4 or 6 or both. If you would like to help with any of those three times, any of those three events, inbox me on Facebook here. Inbox me, put on the churches or my own personal and I will make sure that uh, I reach out to you and line up. We only need about four or five people each event. She says she don't need a whole bunch of people. But I do. I already have a couple people for each uh, time of serve to, to be there. But if I can get a few more, it would be greatly appreciated. Know this, that we love you. We're praying for you. We're here for you. Uh, uh, if you need us, our number is 330-469-5428. I'm extension 215. I still get those calls. If you call the church, I'm extension 215. Uh, Co-pastor is extension 216. Uh, we're still able to receive calls from the church. So uh, don't hesitate to call us if you need us. You can also email pastorwalker at restoreme.org. Uh, and you can also church at restoreme.org. Uh, I will. I read my emails daily, multiple times a day. So if you email me, I'll get it. Uh, I read my emails and check my messages the most. Uh, so email me or call. Uh, and if you call uh, at the church number, please leave your name and your number in case I don't get it so I can call you back because it does not give an ID. Even if you leave your ID on your phone, and I don't get your ID. So RCF, uh, if you call 330-469-5428, I'm extension 215. Uh, and I'll get your call directly from there. And we look forward to hearing from you. Don't forget your offering. Don't forget to stay tuned. Uh, go to our web page. Uh, our web page was updated a little bit. We're in the process of doing some great things. So you can go there and check it out. Uh, continue to pray for one another in this difficult time. And uh, restoration, the members. I'll be on our members page a couple more times this week just to share some in-house things. Uh, but I'll be back on the public page come uh, Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. Uh, God bless you. Have a great night. I look forward to seeing you again. Take care.